God, there was there was so much stuff. I, I just I can't believe I, I think I forgot most of it. And also, after a while, it just was so normal to have all this weird stuff happen. I, you know, I remember I'd get home and I'd be totally exhausted. And, uh, you know, oh, I'd yeah. have I'd have family and friends who wanted to go out and do something. I go like, listen, I just spent the whole day, you know, just, you know, having a blast and having all kinds of weird things happen to me. I'm I'm done. I can't. You know, even neighbors of mine, I remember they'd be like, oh, dude, you must be, we got to go out and drink and party. And I'm like, no, no, we're not. I'm not going anywhere, man. Well, you're, you're, you're a loser. And I'm well, yeah, I guess I am. But man, I tell you what, for eight, 10 hours a day, I'm having an absolute blast. And, and, and I'm, this is who I am when I'm not, not there. I'm, you know, boring because it was such, there was just so much going on all the time. And you got so used to it. It didn't even, you know, like half these stories I don't even remember and you would think you'd remember some of these but god we had something happen every week it was always yeah. something Jeannie, and I was very, very fortunate too because my next job was with an, a guy you know my partner in Baltimore to start was just this, you know we just had fun and, yeah. and did you I just wanted to ask you guys did you get a sense when you were there Mark like I did I, there was a time when I would get weird, worn down you know because I had kids I had small children um, and I would get worn down and it was like God, you know, this is a special moment. I, I, I remember thinking that. This is a special moment. These people are all young and talented, and they're all going somewhere. I, and I, I got to just sit in it and appreciate it right now because I, I, I don't think I, I was. I didn't get that chance because it was my first full-time radio job. And so mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't know what I had until, I tell you what, when I got over to MUS, it only took about five or ten minutes to realize um how special you lost. Sonny was. Yeah, I mean, it was just like it was. It, walking into MUS was like like walking into a brick wall. It was just holy smokes. It was I couldn't I couldn't believe it. And I even went over there with. And, and other that was people. after that was after Tim left too. So you yeah, couldn't, well, I went over with Tim Helsing and uh, Lisa Snell was the office manager and. Um, all three of you went over there. And and Guy Perry. Yeah. Oh, I four. didn't know that. There were four of us, and we got. Did you know? Did you hear we got sued? Goodrich sued us. Yeah, I know of, that. Yeah, yeah, for breach of contract. Yeah. Right. I know um, you had to sit out for a while. Well, you know what? We didn't. We settled out of court. And oh, okay. they were going to force us to sit out. And, of course, I couldn't – who could afford to <laughs> to sit out and fight Bob Goodrich? I mean, that wasn't going to happen. But, uh, yeah, Tim Helsing uh, did a nice job kind of cleaning up that giant mess. And and uh, I had – we had to eat a few dollars, you know. But uh, MUS – I tell you – for everything about MUS, the, their board was fantastic. Oh, yeah. The guy who ran that, who was, I can't remember his name, but he was like 150 years old, was the, the coolest guy, one of the coolest guys I ever met. He was like the chairman. And uh, the, the people who were on this board um, <laughs> were, I don't even remember who they were. They, I just remember they were very businessy, but they were actually very cool about, about the whole situation and all of that. But the culture shock between that and MUS and uh, I, I, I guess when I did, when I did finally come down here to Cincinnati, you know, Randy Michaels was actually running the biz, the the stations down here when I came here. So, um, Randy, I think was a consultant of ours at Sunny for a while, right? I think. Uh, I think was, that's, Tom Owens was, but he was associated with Randy. Yeah. Right. Okay. And Tom, see, and Tom was here too. So both yeah. those guys were here. Do and you, so do you, I got to tell you this. Can I tell you a Randy Michaels story real quick? Absolutely. It involves Sonny FM because he he did come up because Jim was in tight with him. Yep. And and he took us to this. He was speaking at the Spex Howard radio conference in Mount Pleasant. That's Central. Mm -hmm. So we, we all went there as a as a unit. I don't think you were working with. Ah, I can't remember. I don't. Who was I don't. I think I was there, but I didn't go. I think. So afterwards, there's about twelve of us, and he takes us out drinking. And I don't know if you remember a weekend woman that worked here, and I believe her air name was Robin Banks. Yes. Do you remember her? I remember her, yeah. She's very kind of petite and, and very attractive, and he starts hitting on her, like, big time. <laughs> like, he, and he's a Lothario. There's no, I mean, there's, right? Right. And he's, and she is shutting him down at every turn. <laughs> and it was beautiful to watch. It was just beautiful because he's trying every. I can get you a job in Chicago. And she's like, I don't want to work for you. <laughs> and and he's trying to, he's trying to make her, and she's like not having any of it. And I'm like, I'm just like, more power to you, girl. You are beating him up at his own game, and it's wonderful to watch. 
And I tell you, I've got a I've got a story, a, a Randy Michael story for you. So Randy was, um, if, for those that don't understand it, when uh, when the uh, when they released the restrictions on buying radio stations, Randy went on a hooking. He hooked up with is it Zellner or not Zell? Uh, Sam Zell. No, it's the guy out of Texas. I can't remember. Okay. His name. So he hooked up with him and started buying radio stations like there was no tomorrow. And, of course, uh, Randy was the reason they actually made it only six radio stations in a market because he bought eight in Cincinnati. I think he bought 12 in San Diego and eight in Denver. And then they all went, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. But Randy, uh, speaking of you know him and, and women and just doing weird things, when I got there, about a week after I got there, I'd never met him. And he was standing in my studio, and I don't know what he was doing, but I asked him a question, and I didn't know who he was. And and he liked to play with the equipment a lot and, like, mess around with the transmitters. But one day, um, I'm out in the lobby, and there's really nobody there but maybe the the, the, the receptionist and things, things of that sort. And he walks out, and I swear to God, his junk is hanging out of his pants, all right? And, he, and he's walking around. And basically what I heard later on was is that if anybody told him that his stuff was hanging out, he would hand him a $50 bill. <laughs> and he, he, walk, he walked through the whole building like that. I don't know how many $50 bills he handed out, but that's just the kind of crap he did all the time. And when I got there, it was it was pure pandemonium. Um, I remember there was a, there's a rock station there that's pretty famous, at least in Cincinnati. They would play all the music that had F-words in it, and they didn't even mute it. They just they just played them, and Cincinnati's a, a very conservative town. I don't know how they got away with it, but there was something going on all the time. And I remember one of the morning men from the other radio station was having either a birthday or like some big anniversary, like he'd been there for like 40 years. And there was a cake out in the the lobby area there. The guys from EBN, the rock station, had a bunch of strippers come in. They all got naked and they dove into this cake and then ran around the building with like frosting all over themselves. And that was kind of like a normal thing that happened like all the time. So yeah, Randy was, Randy was out there, man. He was, he was out there. And that was, that was the beginning. And then of course, like you said, the Janet Jackson thing happened and all of a sudden life changed as we know it. And, and yeah. uh, all that had to stop. It was, it was, it was fascinating to me how that Janet Jackson thing just blew everything up. It was just, it was so amazing. It was, and it was like overnight too, because prior yes. to that, you know, I was in Baltimore at the time, and we were pretty, we were pretty loose for a hot AC station. We were pretty, um, we were pretty out there, and man, the lawyers just shut everything down. And I can remember our big deal was every year we we pull a big April Fool's prank, and the day before April Fool's, we got a, a long phone call from a lawyer that said, "Don't even try it. Don't yeah. try anything." And I'm like, "No, we're going to do this." And they're like, "Nope, no, you're not." Yeah. No. If we used to have a station who did actually would would broadcast a fake parade and would ask people to come down to the street, and, but they, they'd be they would it was fully produced. It was like an hour long thing, and they, were, they claimed they were down on a street and like these people would show up and there's nothing there. And but on the air it sounded like a real parade, and they did that so every that. year. We did that yeah, sunny. yeah, we did that. that right? every, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, we did it, and there was yeah. there were people out there and they were disappointed. Yeah, they were looking for it and couldn't. And they would call in. Well, where are where are you? Well, it's on Apple. It's on Apple Avenue. It's right there on Seaway. Just just go down a little ways. You can't miss it. I mean, there's march. Listen to this, and we'd have marching bands and all kinds of you know, stuff going on. And, and they'd be like, I just can't find it. You know, I don't know what's going on. Um, yeah. So, so that was that was uh, uh just a. But I never, you know, back to your original thing of of sitting there and realizing what we had. I I didn't. That I didn't experience that because it was my my first gig. Jeannie, did you have any sort of sense of what was going on that time? I loved it. In fact, I never wanted to go home. I would work so late. Yeah. <laughs> was, yes. Like it, since it was so much like family and such a great team, um, I just didn't even want to go home. I'm like yeah, oh, I thought. I thought I you. Longer. I I thought you lived there to tell you the truth. Because there'd be times I was there like at seven, eight o'clock, and I'd be getting ready to roll, and I, your light would be on, and I'd, I'd look around. God, she's still here. Or if you weren't yeah. there, it looked like you were. Had, had just. And I was just like, holy smokes. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of. Um, a lot of a lot of people never really went home. The the program director seemed to be always there, and and uh, and uh, yeah, that was I, it was something. Well, that's what I was I saying, Drew, about I never about looked at the clock. You know, like now I look right. at the clock. Like I'm working now. <laughs> I got my job now. It's like God, I can't get out of here fast enough. Back then, <laughs> right. I didn't care. I didn't care. Well, I got like I was I was t I was t saying too about uh, about Louis. You know, as far as sweet Louis, he was always uh, in the pictures. 
you know, Mark pointed that out. He was always in the pictures because every contest or everything that you guys ever did, Louie was there. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it was, seemed like that. Because he wanted to be like a right, lot of times, right. like, like we, hey, will somebody do this? And he would always put his always hand volunteer, yeah, wouldn't, yeah. yeah. Well, he was that, that was he was that, that was way at MUS too. That was the other thing too. Anybody who wanted to go could go. I mean, that was yeah. there was no restrictions on on any of that. And if it happened to be like you know, if it was JoJo's event, then it was JoJo's event. But you know, we could just go and hang out. I remember, in fact, one of the things we did some sort of volleyball thing with um, was it Playboy Playmates and there right. was. There, there's like photographs of us down there and, and I just like, this is, you know, it was like one of the first things I ever did that I can remember being there. I was like, wow, this is, this is going to be a ride and a half. If this is, if this is normal, <laughs> you know, all this, this, the, the stuff that we could do and, and nobody seemed to have a, had a problem with it. Yeah. It was, I just, I wish I would have appreciated it, you know, uh, back then, but, but, uh, that was, I, I, I wish we could bring that back, especially now after a year like this year. And uh, yeah. and also and also where radio's at, you know, I think yeah. what well, I, mean, I think that, that's the other thing too. I think radio changed from that time of Janet Jackson's thing. I think by then the internet had made its inroads and in, and in the slow descent had started, where yeah. people were a lot more tense around buildings because the money wasn't. I mean, I I don't know how Sunny did, but man, that some of the stations I worked for, the they were rolling in cash. I mean, mm-hmm. the cash flow was so great. And now it's not, it's not there anymore. Well, I've got, yeah, I just I wondered about that yeah. shit with Jeannie. What kind of budget did you have to, to do some of these promotions? Do you, did they give you a budget to do this stuff or they just say, oh, do it, it? Was, it was very low budget. It was, it was, in fact, I don't think a lot of us, you know, got uh, paid enormously amount, but no. we just did it for the love of it. And a lot of the times it was like, um, if something happened, we had to be right on it to capitalize on that moment. So we had to work extra hard to get it done in time to make that moment, you know, carpe diem and make the moment happen. So, yeah, most of the time it was hardly any budget, but the prizes were huge because they were supplied by the clients. Right, so right. Um, those were really good prizes, like the boat, the trips to Aruba and everything else. Yeah, so. The Aruba trip, I forgot about that one. And I think that's why that made those everything. I think that why they made those contests so special is because maybe there wasn't um, enough money to actually pull off the. Because I remember the, I remember the stuff we did. It was more fun than it was like, wow, this is a spectacular event. It was more like, you know, hey, we're 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 going to try to do this with absolutely nothing, and then actually pulling it off. And it was the feeling of the contest more than the actual the material. Uh, behind all of it, and and Jeannie has a good point there. The the timeliness of this stuff from the time I think we would get the idea to when we would do it, it could be as little as a couple of days or even a day. I mean, there's I think there was times where you probably got somebody probably told you, Jeannie, we're going to do this and we're going to do it tomorrow, and and then boom, you'd be gone and off getting whatever needed to be get whatever had yeah. to be picked up or whatever it was. And I just remember stuff would just just bam 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 because I would get these. Hey, we got to do a promo for this, and we got to get that. And a lot of times, we were always waiting on the voice guy to send the stuff back, so we could actually create, you know, something. Um, but that the timeliness that that was the good thing too is that the stuff we did was it was just right there, and there was, you know, we thought about it. This is what happened, and I wish I would have been more involved though in, in the thought process there because I just remember stuff just coming at us and uh, not even knowing what the hell's going on and then to you know to 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 the the ability to be able to pull it off and everybody seemed to be in sync i don't remember any of the jocks ever like what the hell are we doing here nobody ever complained i can't believe we're giving away this or anything like that it was i don't know it was just it was just an odd thing um and anything we did was that was the coolest thing that was going on and we just all just jumped on it and did it and and it just worked it just weird just weird it was an incredible team everybody just pitched in it was so incredible and then yeah since we didn't have a lot of money we had to be crazy and do things yeah. <laughs> just in a fun fun way and it was the most best team ever <laughs> yeah and, and, and the best compliment i can pay to Jean, Jeannie was when i got to baltimore i expected that turnaround to still be there and it wasn't, and it wasn't. like no they had professional promotion you know they had not that Jeannie wasn't a professional because she was uh, wholeheartedly, but they had like people had been there 20 years and I, they'd be like, what you need it tomorrow? That ain't yeah. happening. No. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. I got, yeah. I got down here. They had a staff of 20 promotions people and we couldn't oh, yeah. get anything. You couldn't get anything done. 
and you know that nobody knew what to do. there was like one person who knew what to do and the rest of them i don't know what they were they, they were doing genie you could have gone anywhere and, and ruled <laughs> ruled any market any anywhere without without it you would have been shocked at like this is what you guys are wow this is yeah. this is pretty and pathetic if- yeah, I wrote copy too, so I, I did yes. that, and I was a copywriter. <laughs> I, and I I don't know how you did it. I don't know. I don't understand how you did it because you also wrote copy really fast, and I don't. And it was on a typewriter. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then when I got my first Mac computer, it smoked up. It just fried. <laughs> <laughs> and what was also amazing is is that I don't remember ever getting a script from Genie that was either too long or too short. It was always right on the. I never, ever, ever had to go back and go, "Hey, Jeannie, this is too long. Can I, you know, can I chop this or do that?" Never, ever, ever. I don't think I've ever had a script since then that was either that was that was either on time anymore. It just it just never happened again. I thought, and again, I thought that was a normal thing, right? I, that you just. Aww. I'm honest, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not even making it up. But I don't know how you. I don't know how you did all of that, and I don't remember you ever complaining or being like, uh, you know, that. Yeah. That was the other thing too. I don't remember anybody ever complaining about. Oh, I can't believe I got to do this, right? I, you know, I can't go home or I can't do this. It was just, I, just everybody did it, and it just, it was just odd, just really odd in in a great way compared to the stations uh, that I went to, where these people, you know, they weren't having, God, they weren't having near as much fun as. Uh, as I as I was even in you know even MUS was to some degree was kind of fun in in its way but the, some <laughs> of the staff some of the staff members there were just on a completely different trajectory you know when it came to uh, how they looked at radio it's just too bad everybody didn't get a chance to kind of go through a situation uh, like Sunny and experience that um, yeah. and uh, you know that's 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 what I remember and there was you know down here there were a couple of radio stations. That that still have that same kind of you know I worked down here for 24 years and there's there's a, there's there are still a, a group of people the guys on 700 WOW and the people on EBN um, of course that's different now there's not a whole lot of people there but those two radio stations those were the those were the ones we kept kind of in number one and number two position we used the other ones as blockers um, those people were having an absolute blast and doing whatever they wanted to so I know it does happen you know it did happen at other radio stations but um, not a lot. Not a lot of them. Do you remember well, some some of those uh, commercials that you did, you did with Jeannie? I remember you did some stuff with her too. Do you remember some of the the fun ones that you guys did together? Well, I remember there was there was a, there was we were doing. I think it was Sticker Man. It was like a promo for Sticker Man, and I had Jeannie come in and cut. Uh, there was a couple of lines. She was I, I think she was like a damsel in distress somewhere along the side of the road or something like that, and she was. And I just remember she she did this. I I even have it in my demo I used to like get extra work, and she just yells out something to the effect of like, "And I chipped a nail," and the way she said it was was just awesome. And, okay, Jeannie, uh, do got, it. Come on, Jeannie, do it. And I chipped a nail. It was, <laughs> and it was had something to do with with sticker man. But I would I, and that would be the other thing too. You just you just hey Jeannie, can you come in here and cut a few lines? <laughs> yeah, no problem. I didn't I didn't have to wait. She would just come on in, and she would just, you know, read whatever net needed to be read, and 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 cut it. And it was always, it was always perfect. That was the other thing too, is that you could grab anybody from the building, anybody. Um, there was only a few people that just flat out couldn't get them, you know, uh, in the studio to cut something. But other than that, you know, you could get any of the salespeople. Uh, Lisa Snell would come in at a drop of a hat. Um, you know, Jeannie would come in. Everybody would just kind of. Uh, uh, kind of come in and 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 do whatever needed to be done. And again, the spots, uh, the creativity behind the spots that that I thought we were doing was spectacular. Um, I don't think I've ever worked in another radio station since where you could actually listen through a commercial break and maybe be entertained um, with by the local, <laughs> by the local stuff, not just the national stuff, but the 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 local stuff. Um, and of course, that was my first radio job, and I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I was just okay. I guess, I guess. Let's see. Jeannie wrote this, and I guess I'm just gonna do this with it, and <laughs> everybody will like it, and that'll be that. And you know, that's it that's was all done really- by Ranger Bob. He's the best. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you ever? Did you ever get anything turned away by a client? Did, did you ever do something you thought was pretty creative, and then they said, "Nah, it's." I just yeah, you know. To copy. Um, you know, at the very beginning, no. Um. Because I think if anybody was going to advertise on Sunny, they kind of knew what they were going to get. <laughs> um, 
So, but I don't, you know, Jeannie didn't write, and of course, Jeannie wrote all the copy. I don't remember writing any copy whatsoever until I was the sort of creative guy that wrote, and I think I wrote, got in the three months I was there, I think I wrote three commercials. It wasn't a lot. But Jeannie never wrote anything that was like, you know, was like totally like nobody would like. It was always, you know, it was, it. she would take the idea and and just and just run with it. And so I don't remember a client ever ever saying anything about you know, and I don't know if we ever got the scripts approved before they were produced. I don't, I don't remember how that worked. Um, I remember the spots were always produced, but I don't remember anybody ever saying, wow, that's just the worst thing I've ever heard. You got to start over again. And until you got and, to MUS and, and yeah. well, MUS, it's, I, don't, I don't remember it being that bad there either. Although I do remember there was a guy that was, that had a little small car dealership he would come in to cut a commercial. That was like the first time I ever had a client come in. That was the other thing. A lot of clients didn't come in to record their commercials at Sunny for some reason. I don't know why they didn't, but they, no, they I didn't. Don't remember that. Yeah. yeah, it didn't happen a lot. And at MUS, I had one client, and the guy was always drunk when he came in. <laughs> All, I think he was just so nervous. And his commercials were just awful. Um, you know, but he was always he's always just super nervous. But I don't remember that, yeah, I don't remember the commercials. Again, it was one of those things where you just did whatever you wanted, and um, I think because I was so new at it, I think that was also an advantage. I, my my guess is is that I probably could have done more or extended whatever I was doing a little bit further over the edge, but I never I never really got there. And Jeannie's scripts never really lended themselves to. She never really put me in a position where I felt like, oh my God, I either I can't do this or. It was, nah, we shouldn't do this. I, I don't remember ever going back to, to Jeannie saying, um, listen, this is really bad, and we're not going to do it. That that never happened. I don't remember ever, 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 ever doing that. Now, now was Blaine was Blaine part of your crew, Joe, or was it Blaine? Blaine was there when I first started. He was Jim Biggins. Oh, um, Biggins guy. Okay. Producer, yeah. He so was also Kevin Ma- he was also like- He was also Kevin Matthews' producer, because I remember talking yeah. to him about Kevin Matthews. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. had he had been Kevin Matthews' producer at LAB, and then he got married. And he got married very young, um, and so when Kevin went to Chicago, he wanted to take Blaine with him, but he, Blaine said, "I'm I'm married, and you know I got to stay here." And he ended up getting divorced anyway. So, um, <laughs> but he wound up Blaine wound up um, producing the Rocky Allen Show in, at PLJ in New York City, so it wasn't like he was. You know, I think getting divorced was the best thing that happened to him. Yeah, he had some I funny stuff. That. Funny stuff. Oh, he yeah, was. No, he Blaine would, was a great, yeah. great guy, and he would help out. Like when I would sit in for Biggins, he was the one who would say, "Hey, we can do anything you want." <laughs> yeah. And he helped, um, what? He what? Did, go ahead. He, he did some really good bits. My favorite bit of Blaine's was something he he did a commercial for something called the Heavy Petting Zoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We have a petting zoo, and over here we have a heavy petting zoo. If you want, to, <laughs> if you really like the animals, and, <laughs> and I remember he he went to ODJ. He went to ODJ and was producing a morning show for them, and they would right. play it. And I said, "Give it to me, and I'll play it." Yeah. Wow. What about what about um, now the the Jacques Cousteau things that you used to do? Is that all national stuff, or was that was that local too? You know, the Jacques Cousteau and the uh, underwear world of Jacques Cousteau. Do you remember oh, those? Was, or? Are you talking about like Biggins? Oh, was that um, Biggins that did that? I thought that was you that yeah, did those. Was, there was a service we had called the American Comedy Network. Okay. That would provide us with scripts. For, I think he did a Barney Fife character that was off of that too. <laughs> and they really wanted me to do that stuff, but I was like, nah. Mm-mm. Okay, I thought that was you. Because I, I remember that one, especially the, the underwear, underwear world of Jacques Cousteau. Yeah. No, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember ACN over at. Uh, I remember I used to collect their the the tapes, the morning show. They would come in on reel to reel, and then they would just toss them, you know, when they're done using them. And I used to have a whole box of those things, and I used to listen to that ACN stuff. That was some really. I don't know. I can't remember who the guy was that actually led that up, but uh, the guy had a they, great read, and it was so funny. Oh yeah, All they did it. quality stuff, and and I'll tell oh. you, it was a, a lot of what Biggins did. And I felt bad for him because I think that they really wanted him to do Rich Michael's show. Hmm. Kind of, and and he he was kind of led down that way. And when when I took over, I told, you know, Chuck, I'm not doing that. And and they were cool with that. That was the you know, 
I was just like, no, I'm not doing Rich's show. I, I did yeah. it for a little bit, but then I was like, no, I can't. This isn't me. Hmm. And what what was Rich's show? Rich, Rich, by the way, if you don't know, Rich Michaels was, uh, I think if I remember it right, he had the highest ratings in the top 100 markets for a morning show when he was at VIC. Yeah, and he made um, some big money, too. Yeah. He, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you how much money he made because when I was there as a part-timer, I was thinking about, you know, gosh, should I continue on with college or should I just finish my associates and try to get a full-time job and all of that? And I happened to walk into Mark Maloney's office at night because I was filling in at night, and uh, he had the the budget out there on the on the thing you want to you want to guess how much money he was making if this would have been 19 this would have been 88 want to take a guess 150k it was 139 wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was making 27 <laughs> I was, I was yeah. making seventeen six when I thought I was a zillionaire when I got when I got to Sunny. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I was rich. I was weird. <laughs> I don't do anything. Yeah. What what Jeannie's yeah. probably going, I made thirteen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> she's not saying. She's she's smart. She's not saying. What what about what about Biggins though? What really do you know what really happened? I mean, you were there. You're of yeah, all of us. You, was, um, you were there. Yeah, and I think we went over this one, Mark, and I did the interview with you, but it's the same thing. It was, um, they had 107.3, they bought it, and they, you know, it was pretty clear that they were going to, they really made it, they were going to take it oldies, because there was a hole in the Grand Rapids market for that. And there were two CHRs over there, so it didn't make any sense for us to simulcast 107.3 and go after KLQ and GRD. And, um... But they fainted that. They faked that we were going to do that. They made everybody think we were, they were taking 107.3 and it was just going to simulcast Sunny. Huh. And it was beautifully executed because they fooled everybody, including Biggins, and he was not happy. So basically they, they, they led him to believe that he was going to be on a GR. And then they, they flipped it to oldies and none of the staff that was involved at Sunny was involved over there. Yeah, so I often wondered what happened. There was kind of a changing of the guard because it seemed like yeah. everybody bolted. When I got there, I think Dan Mulder actually showed me around the, the building all what seven foot ten of him. The yeah. guy was giant. The guy was tall, and I think he was the last one to kind of leave, from what I what I recall, because he was gone the week week after I uh, I was there. I think Bolello was the production director before me. I think Kevin yeah. Jakubowicz filled in between. Valella and me, and mm -hmm. and I think every, yeah, it's, there seemed to be a total changing of the guard, right as I got there. There yeah. was there yeah. was um. So when that whole 1073 thing went down, it soured a lot of people. So a lot. So I got there in April and I was doing nights, and then JJ Dooling quit because he was supposed to be made program director and he didn't, and so he left, and then I took afternoons, and then by. December, the program director who had hired me was gone. And then you're right, then it was just like wholesale flipping. And I was the only one who, who was that, uh, you know, yeah. was on both ends of that. So, how, how many people got killed from ego? And that's uh, kind of what it sounds like when the when their ego got damaged, they kind of just said, okay, I'm going. I'm yeah, going. and I hate, I hate saying that because I don't know, you yeah, know? Yeah. I yeah. probably shouldn't. Say but I mean, that. as far as uh, eagles go, you, you and and, uh, and you're Ranger also, Bob yeah, are you're probably also talking about people probably who are grounded. Fairly go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm saying you and Ranger Bob are probably the two people that I know that are pretty well grounded as far as that kind of thing. You just do your own thing, and somehow <laughs> it just kind of works for you. So because it's it's radio, we're not like doing no, know, I, exactly, exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but I, I the, both those guys were talented. All those people who left were extremely talented. Right. And went yes, to they were. Yeah. Market. So, you know, I think it was just the, their time. Yeah. You know, they thought, oh, this is my time to go because, you know, I've been here three years and, and, and I think Biggins went to Toledo. So yep. he, you know, yeah. upped, upped himself and Dueling wound up programming a station in Louisville. So, you know, yeah. So they, I think, I think they just thought, well, if I'm not going to be involved in this, I'm going to move. Move yeah. on. Yeah. And I think there was also there was a your your lifespan at a radio station from what I remember anybody any station I ever worked at before that as a part timer, people were coming and going at like if you were at a station yeah. more than two years people were like what are you doing you need to move on and move up. Yeah. Um, 
you know. I'm the, I'm the exception to that rule. I just stay places forever. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. So, as I say, the two of you, yeah, you've just kind of kind of stayed where you're, you know, where you go. Yeah, because so. I had an option to go over to um, ODJ, um, and I was offered uh, an assistant program director's position, and I was like, what? I, no, I don't. That's I don't want to do that. I just got here, and I haven't even figured out this production thing yet, and. Uh, so, yeah, you know, yeah, people were, that seemed to be the normal thing, move, 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 move. And then, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden I was there, you know, for six years. And, and what, Jeannie, you said you were there for six? Is that? Yeah, six years. Okay. Yeah. So you, you got, when did you, you got there, when, Biggins would have been there when you were there. Yeah, I think he had just, everybody just left when I got there. It was oh, really okay. weird. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, that's kind of when yeah, I, he, when he, I came he, into he picture too. after I did, yeah. Okay. Did, yeah. did did Haas hire you, Jeannie? 